I'm speaking today to a group of many college students, and so I decided for a second I would put myself in their shoes. So I asked myself, Ryan, <clears throat> if you're in college today, what would you be studying to prepare yourself for the future? Given everything that's going on in the world, what would you do to prepare yourself for the world of tomorrow? And so I got stuck, because what I realized was that I can't study many of the things that I most need uh, today, that I'll most need for tomorrow. For instance, based on what we see happening with artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, I might need a degree in something like robot psychology if I'm going to be able to get along with my new coworkers. <laughs> based on what we see happening with the renewed space race, I might need a degree in something like intergalactic relations <laughs> if I'm going to be relevant in the new space economy. Maybe I'm a foodie and I want to be a chef. Well, based on what we see happening with global food supply trends, I'm more likely to be cooking crickets than chicken. <laughs> and so I might need a degree from a culinary arts school in something like insect proteins. <laughs> we have some pretty good ideas about where the world is going, and yet I can't major in any of those things today. They simply don't exist yet. And I realize that this is really the challenge of education. We're trying to prepare young people for the world of tomorrow, but all we have is the limited knowledge of today. And for those of us who are educators, we not only have the limited knowledge of today, but we're always using the tools of yesterday, the software of yesterday, the equipment of yesterday. It's never up to date. So we're trying to prepare young people for the world of tomorrow with the knowledge of today and the tools of yesterday. But I thought, well, this isn't a terribly new problem. We've been educating people for hundreds of years, and we've got here. We must be doing fine. How did we do that? And so I decided to look into history to see what lessons it could teach us today, could teach you all today, to prepare you for the world of tomorrow. And so I picked two dates that are of particular interest to you all, 1959 and 1989. And I chose these dates because, roughly, these are the dates that your grandparents and your parents would have been sitting in the same position that you're in today, trying to decide what should they study to prepare themselves for the world of tomorrow. So let's look at 1959 and see what it might have to teach us. What was the world like in 1959? It wasn't until 1959 that we had ever seen this picture. We did not know what our Earth looked like until this year because we couldn't send a satellite out far enough and get the picture back on land. In 1959, we had created something called the microchip. It was made out of an element known as germanium. It was bigger than my wallet. And even at this size, it wasn't strong enough to power even a calculator. Here in Africa, only 11 countries were independent in 1959. And the rest of the continent was being run from Europe. And in 1959, the most cutting-edge phone was this phone, <laughs> the princess phone. And to dial it, you had to put your finger on the dial, that's why we called it dial, and spin the wheel over and over. This was, the, this was the world that your grandparents were living in. And so imagine they're like you, looking around the world, trying to understand, how do I prepare myself for the future, given everything that I see? Maybe they would have been captured by the, by the satellites going to space. And they might have said, OK, I want to go learn calculus. And so they would work with their professor to do by hand all the calculus necessary needed to go to put satellites into space. Or maybe they thought this microchip thing sounded pretty cool, and so they'd go to the library or the lab, and they'd read up on this element called germanium. The problem is that by the time your grandparents graduated, the world changed on them. Pretty soon, NASA was, hiring, was not hiring people to do calculus by, by hand, and they were buying IBM computers. Pretty soon, manufacturers stopped making uh, microchips out of germanium and started making them out of silicon, Silicon Valley. And so even if your grandparents were at the best university in the world, with the best professors in the world, studying the most cutting-edge knowledge of the day, by the time they graduated, that, that knowledge was already obsolete. OK, so no easy answers there. Thanks, Grandpa. Um, but maybe, maybe there might be some answers from 1989. It wasn't so long ago. Maybe your parents' generation can teach us more. Well, in 1989, no longer were we enamored by seeing Earth from space, but jaws were dropping at the new close-ups that we were getting from Jupiter. In 1989, we saw the fall of the Berlin Wall, and with it, the crumbling of the Soviet Union. 
the Cold War was finally over. In 1989, the microchip was old news, but the Microsoft first edition office suite was hot off the press. And even though it was only 46 megabytes, it took 32 disks loaded over the course of days to make it work. Here in Africa and around the world, everyone united in a call for Nelson Mandela's freedom. And yet he still would not be released from prison for a year. And in 1989, the most popular phone was one like this, the Motorola MicroTAC. It was not very micro, it was nine inches long, <laughs> but it was one of the first cell phones. It had a, it had a phone book, it had, an, it had a calculator, but it could not text. It only had a 30-minute battery, and it cost $3,000. So this is the world of your parents. Again, like you, looking around them, trying to decide, what can I... What can I study to be on the cutting edge of where this world is going? And maybe they would be watching the 6 o'clock news thinking, man, this, I can't believe the Cold War is coming to an end. I want to be a part of putting this world back together. So they decide to study international relations. So they go to class, and what would they study? The international relations theory of the last 40 years of the Cold War. Or they could study the international theory from before that that caused the Cold War. But even if that was okay, guess what? Your parents still would have had to go to the library because for all intents and purposes, the internet did not exist yet. Unless you worked for one of a couple government agencies, you didn't have access, and even if you did, there was no such thing as a search engine. No Google. Now, in case you're feeling bad for your parents or your grandparents, I just want to introduce one other character to the story that I think deserves a bit of sympathy, and that's the educators. Imagine being a science teacher in 1959. Your best case scenario is having a textbook from 1958, printed in 1958, written in 1957. That was before they knew about the microchip, before they knew about quasar stars, before they knew about how RNA and DNA interact, and before they knew anything about in vitro fertilization. That happened in those two years. So you go to class on the first day with a brand new two-year-old textbook, and how are you supposed to prepare your young people to be on the cutting edge with those tools? In 1989, you might have had a, a pull-down map, brand new, and that still would have had a country on it called USSR on it. In fairness, my father, who taught in an American public high school until 2012, had that same map hanging in his room until he retired. Our educators do amazing things, and yet, it's hard to prepare the leaders of tomorrow when you're using tools that are older than the students themselves. And it kind of brings us back to this problem, that we're trying to prepare young people for the world of tomorrow and all that might come, but all we have is the knowledge of today and the tools of yesterday. And that brings us to today. College students like yourself around the world are trying to decide what they should do reading everything that's going on around them, trying to understand what they should do to prepare themselves for the world of tomorrow. So what's going on around you? <laughs> Already in 2019, for the first time ever, we have a picture of a black hole, something no one ever thought possible. Already in 2019, we have data showing that the last five years have been the hottest five ever on record, and scientists have no idea where this stops. Already in 2019, a computer has created something like this, a bacterial genome, which means it's the first time that a machine has created a germ from scratch. And already in 2019, two African countries have seen uprisings on a continent that is young, undereducated, underemployed, and poised to be the biggest workforce in the world in, in, in within two decades. And in case any of this is surprising you because you heard about it, or you didn't hear about it, or you heard about it and forgot, don't feel bad. It's probably because you're suffering from information overload. We just found out last year that of all the data ever created in history, including all ancient texts, 90% of the world's data was actually created in 2016 and 2017. 
and it's only accelerating. The current estimates are that we are creating 146 gigabytes per, per, of data per person per day on Earth right now. I don't know about you, but it sort of feels like the world's accelerating. Educators are trying to prepare young people for the world of tomorrow, and yet today's knowledge is old as of the last news cycle this morning. And yesterday's tools are called an iPhone 10 that were cutting edge just a couple months ago. And so it's in the middle of this storm that African Leadership College, our college, decided that we needed to do something different. We needed to take a different approach to educating the leaders of tomorrow. But we don't want to educate them just to survive the future. We need young leaders who will shape the future. And indeed, this is our mission. It's our mission to create catalysts for change, movement builders, and entrepreneurial leaders who will create a future that we all want to see. To do this, we've decided to create a new degree. In the middle of all this chaos, 2019, we're creating a new degree. But we're not building this new degree uh, to be useful just for today. We're not grounding it in the knowledge of today. Because we know, based on research, that the knowledge of today has a lifespan of maybe five or ten years. Rather, we're building a degree that we think could be as useful on Mars as it is in Mauritius. It's a degree that's grounded in enduring and durable skills. It's a degree that we based on knowledge that, uh, skills, excuse me, that, that transcend sectors and eras and even planets. I want to tell you about one such skill using a story, once again, from 1959. If any of you know the Hidden Figures story, you know of the amazing African-American women who helped take the U.S. to space in the 50s and 60s. One woman in the middle of that story was Mrs. Dorothy Vaughn. And she was a brilliant mathematician, but at some point she found herself up against an IBM computer. And she realized that she better learn to run that machine if she was going to save her job from it. And so at 50 years old, she taught herself a, code, a difficult coding language to run one of the most powerful computers in the world. She did. She saved her job, and she built a career, continued a career that we all celebrate today. And in so doing, Mrs. Vaughn shows us a really critical skill for the future, which is what we call being autodidactic. It means having the ability to teach yourself something. And learning how to learn is just one of the critical skills that young people are going to need to have for the world of tomorrow, along with problem solving and critical thinking, along with teamwork and innovation, empathy and resilience, quantitative reasoning and systems thinking. And with these skills in hand, we believe that our young leaders will be ready not only for, to, to, but for today, but also for tomorrow. But that's only if we unshackle them from yesterday. We cannot train tomorrow's leaders with yesterday's approaches to education, of lectures and teacher-based classrooms and rote memorization. We have decided to build our degree around a new learning model that puts the students in the driver's seat and permeates the barrier between the classroom and the real world. We asked every student at ALU to create uh, to, to choose a problem that they want to solve in the world and to spend their college career addressing it. We call this a mission. And we invite every student at ALU to declare a mission instead of a major. And when students declare a mission, they get the chance to craft their own learning journey around their own particular passions and interests and aspirations. When students declare a mission, they get a chance to study different disciplines, not for credit only, but for credibility as they address their problems. When students declare a mission, they build an advisory board of experts from around the world that help them on their journey. And they get a faculty guide who's with them th from, from the start through the end of their mission. Most importantly, when students declare a mission, they get a chance to focus on solving a global challenge, not on getting a piece of paper. I want to tell you about one student at ALC who's been on a mission. This is Olfa. Olfa's a, a fourth-year student. She's very smart and very driven. But Olfa will admit to you that when she came to ALC, 
she was used to a system that told her what to think, where to go, and how to get a job of yesterday. We did none of those things. In fact, we asked her, Ulfa, what do you want to do? When we found out, and she found a faculty guide, she was able to get an internship creating a, art, art, sorry, excuse me, creating a light institution at an art show. As a part of this internship, she had to teach herself how to code and how to use electronics. She did brilliantly. And after that, she was so empowered by what she was able to learn and accomplish with just a little help from a faculty member and a lot of curiosity. After that, she became a missions machine. Since that time, she's created a smart refrigerator that can track your eating and your spending. She started working on a rideshare app in Mauritius, and she has co-founded a uh, women in tech conference called Switch that is launching in Mauritius in, 20, in, in June and is going global in 2020. The incredible thing is that Ulfa did all of this outside of old school classrooms. We believe at ALC that every student's story should be like Ulfa's, driven by the student's personal interests and aspirations, supported but not owned by faculty members, and rooted in real-world realities and global challenges that we have to solve. We invite all of you, students here, educators, uh, pro uh, professionals, regulators, everyone here and around the world to join ALC in rethinking what education can look like and how we prepare young people for the world of tomorrow. Because this is our mission. Thank you. <laughs>